The first lesson is found in the book of Psalms, number 126, beginning with verse 1. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who saw sow with tears with, will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel reading this morning comes from Luke's gospel, chapter 2, beginning with verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior is born, has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. <sighs> wow. <sighs> now, last night I had a dream. When I woke, I felt like I needed to go find like men or women of faith from of old to ask them what it meant to, to understand it. Kind of like when Joseph helped Pharaoh understand about the, um, the seven years of great harvest followed by the seven years of famine. Well, in my dream, there were no rivers and there were no cows. It was just me standing in the middle of a desert. <sighs> my fingers were blistered. My skin was so hot from the sun. My lips were cracked. <sighs> and I've never been that thirsty. Mm. Never in my whole life. It was, I was so thirsty. And all I wanted to do was cry. But I didn't have any tears to cry. I was so dry. And then I heard this voice whispered on the wind, made the hair stand up on my arms and, uh, when this cool breeze swept over my body. And I woke up immediately. I was, it was so startling, so real. I, I sat up in bed and I can understand what Elijah felt when he heard the voice of God on that mountain, you know, after the earthquake and the fire and the wind. Those words just stuck with me. It's as if they were written across the wallpaper of my bedroom. And then I noticed that I'd left this mess of wrapping paper and scissors and tape after wrapping presents the night before. Wow. That was just weird. I mean, I... I just... Those words were just amazing. What were they that startled me so? Drink deeply from the rivers of my delight. Drink deeply? From where? I, there's no water in sight. And then when I was trying to figure out how I could build a time machine to go back to Egypt, Egypt and, and when it's rising to prominence, um, I thought well, maybe I could find Joseph in the prison cell and ask him. The answer came to me just like that, as if the voice of the Spirit was telling me, the desert is where we're at. 
it's where we've been through. It's what we're going through. I have never felt so depleted in my whole life. I don't know about you, but there has been such a tough year. This has been a difficult several years season. And I, I, I think there's been so much confusion, uncertainty, fear, anger, loneliness that many of us have never felt before. And it all came to us at once. And some of us were prepared with sunscreen, toilet paper, <laughs> extra supplies. But some of us didn't even bring a hat. I know it's weird. I know it's weird talking about deserts in the middle of Christmas season, waiting for snow. And we think about eggnog and ice and cold. And I know it's strange to talk about deserts, but you know what's even stranger? <sighs> Prepare, preparing for the Christmas season. <sighs> this is going to be strange. Dry. You know, this is the time when we need our family the most. You know, we need to hug our loved ones and, and kiss a little newborn baby and sing Christmas carols at the top of our lungs off key. Open presents and laugh. As I was wrapping the presents last night, I was going through the motions and pulling out decorations, planning the Christmas traditional meals and parties. But it's not joyful. It's dry. But the voice keeps whispering, drink deeply. Where? And from what? His spirit, my friends. His wonderful, sweet, refreshing spirit. If I've learned anything in this season, I've learned that you can never have enough. Enough toilet paper in the linen closet. Enough supplies, canned goods on the pantry shelf. And there aren't enough batteries in this world to get us out of the darkness. My faith, my strength, my traditions and habits, no matter how good they are, they're not enough. I may be going through a dry or weary land, but there's a river that never runs dry. And I guess I needed to be reminded or perhaps warned in a dream that from this river you can never get enough. So I'm going to run to it. Go to his spirit, drink deeply, and do it all over again. And you know, in this season of Advent, when we're lighting the Advent candles, it reminds us that even in the desert, God refreshes us. And even when we're in the dark, his light shines. So I just implore you that no matter how you feel, that in his great mercy, we can find the joy of God again. So let's go. Drink deeply and find true joy. <laughs> I'm supposed to follow that. Yeah, right. Let's pray. <laughs> Dear Father, thank you for bringing us to your house today. Thank you for just being here and being present with us and, and sending your son to fill up our hearts with an inexpressible, glorious joy that comes only from him. So Holy Spirit, we've heard you. We've, we've, we're trying to comprehend and understand what you're trying to tell us today, and so I just pray that you'll open up our minds and our hearts, and I pray that you'll take me out of your way, come and have your, your way with your people, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we were singing and as we were listening to um, the skit, these words from Isaiah kept running through my head over and over, and I just want to share them with you because 
we are in a time, a desert time right now. And it has been a really hard couple of years. And it doesn't really seem like Christmas. But listen to what God says. He's, this is Isaiah 43. And he says... Um, this is what the Lord says, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. We are his. We should find strength in that. In a time when joy feels like it can't be seen or felt or heard or found, we're God's. And he's redeemed us. And he says, when you pass through the waters, I'm, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God. I am the Holy One of Israel. I am your Savior. And nowhere in that passage did he say, you're never going to walk in the water and you're never going to walk through fires, and you're never going to be in a river that feels like it's going to sweep over you. He never said that. He said, when you go through these things, I'm going to be with you. In this last couple of years, when we've been going through it, and we have been going through things, there's never been a day when the Lord hasn't been with us. But that doesn't mean that we've always recognized that he's right next to it. It's not that we understand at every moment of every day he's right next to us. Because there are times in these last couple of years when this desert has been so dry. And our thirst has been so deep that it has been hard to find him. And even as Christians, it's been hard. So can you imagine what the world is like? Those who don't know Christ, if we are struggling, can you imagine what's happening to them? This Christmas, sometimes we as Christians feel guilty because we aren't full of joy and we aren't just smiling. And so we plaster these fake masks on ourselves. And we stuff everything way down deep and we think, after Christmas, I'll deal with that. But right now, I have to show the world that I'm full of joy. We cannot ignore the deepest struggles that we are going through. We have to find the joy and we have to run to it. It's one of the reasons this year that it has been exciting to learn more about the Holy Spirit because it's the Holy Spirit who brings the presence of Jesus to our heart. It's the Holy Spirit who gives us the ability to drink from the living water of Jesus. It's one of the reasons I love this psalm. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongues with songs of joy. We are not always going to be right here in this moment, in this desert. And I can't wait for a time when we are here and the songs of joy are just spilling out of us like nothing we've ever experienced before. And we will be throwing our arms in the air and we will be praising Jesus like we've never praised him before. He is the God who's getting us through it. I love how the message translation of the last part of this psalm goes. God, do it again. Bring rain to our drought-stricken lives so those who planted their crops in despair can shout yes at the harvest. Do it again, God, so those who went off with heavy hearts will come back laughing with armloads of blessing. How exciting it is that the joy of Christmas will bring that kind of exuberant, do-it-again feeling to our heart. We need the Holy Spirit this Christmas to help us find again and connect again to Christmas joy. 
Not worldly joy, not worldly happiness, but true Christmas joy. A Christmas joy that comes from God. And Christmas joy is so powerful that it can hold its own and it can sustain us in the dryness of the desert we find ourselves walking in. Christmas joy, God's joy, is so powerful it holds its own in the middle of all of the suffering that we've been going through, all of the troubles and all of the sorrows. It sustains us in our pain and in our sickness and in our grief and in our addictions. All of the brokenness of this world cannot match the power of our God's joy. But today when we're talking about joy and we've admitted that some of us can't find it and feel it, what do we do? Where can we find God's joy this year? Where can we find God's joy when we're still suffering the ongoing effects of this pandemic and we're lonely and we're in pain and we're stressed? And yes, sometimes it's, we're even angry. I found myself this week feeling like I have never felt before. I told a few people, I think somebody came and stole baby Jesus out of the manger of my heart. But you know what? When I said that and I prayed, God, I don't want to be that way. You know what? I woke up the next morning and baby Jesus was right back in that manger. And God said, no, we're not going to be this way. I'm going to give you my Christmas joy. The Bible tells us there is one place only where we can find Christmas joy. And that place is Bethlehem. Bethlehem, where we can go and we can hear what the angel said. The angel said, the message is for us. Pastor Christine, the angel said, Christine, I bring you Good news of great joy. Right? Yeah. John, the angel said, I bring you good news of great joy. Michael, the angel said, the good news of great joy is for you because today in the city of David, Christ the Lord is born. This message is a personal message. Can you hear the angel speaking to you this morning? The past two years have been hard, it has. But it's okay to admit it. This is the place to admit it. If there's any safe place in the world where we can come and we can get real with God and we can tell him how we've been feeling, it should be here in his house. This should be the safest place where we can pour out our prayers to him and we can be honest with him and we can say, when are you coming back? Because we need you. We're struggling, God, and we need you to be here. Don't make the mistake of falling into the enemy's trap of trying to find Christmas joy in the world because you won't find it. The bright lights of the Christmas decorations along your city streets or in the malls or if you drive downtown to the city square, you're not going to find Christmas joy because that's not where it comes from. You won't find it when you're decorating your tree at home or you're wrapping your presents or you're spending that money that you don't have, but you're trying to get that perfect gift because somebody you love needs something. That's not where you're going to find perfect Christmas Joy, nothing in this world can fill our hearts with a heavenly joy. It can only come from God. In 1530, Martin Luther wrote a Christmas message to his people. I want to share just a couple of things that he said. Because Luther impl implores us to respond to the faith being offered to us by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who gives us the strength to believe that this child, Jesus, first of all, was truly born. This is not a myth. This is a real story. 
And the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to not only understand that he was born, but that baby Jesus was sent by God himself into this world to be the light that overcame the darkness. He himself is to be our Savior and our King. Luther says this, We must believe and we must profess that this child who is born of the Virgin is not only his mother's son, he is more than Mary's, for he was born for me, Luther says. For the angel said, to you is born the Savior. So should we not shout out, amen, I thank you, dear Lord, for sending your son for us when we hear these words. Amen, right? Should we not react that way when we hear, this baby is for me. This baby is for you. This baby came for all people all over the world, all over the generations, from eternity to eternity. Jesus Christ is our Savior, and he is our Lord, and he is the source of Christmas joy. And so this Advent, if we really want to be joyful, we need the, to allow the Holy Spirit to come right now and to take us by the hand and walk us to the manger. It would have been so exciting to be one of those shepherds I have this vision in my mind that when they showed up, Mary shared Jesus with the world. You know, he may have been laying in that hay, but in my mind, she picks him up and she just goes, here you go. You know, and I see this picture of Jesus and he just goes like this. And he's like, come here. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here for you, for you all. God's inexpressible, glorious joy comes from the heart of Jesus, not from the world. This joy is not worldly joy. It's not worldly happiness. It's not fleeting. It's forever. True joy of Christmas comes and takes up residence in our heart. When we hear the angel say, the Christ child is born for you and for me. And for the whole world. True Christmas joy is at the center of the announcement of the birth of Jesus. Given first to the shepherds by the angel who said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born in this, this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. In Luke's gospel, the angel brings the good news of great joy to the shepherds, but he also brings it to us. In the city of David, a Savior, Christ, the long-awaited Lord, is born. The good news of great joy is found in the truth that God kept his promise. From the very beginning, when the fall happened in the Garden of Eden, God said, I'll make a way. I'll send my son. From then until now, they waited, and they waited, and they waited. And God kept his promise. God's timing is not our timing. Christ is coming again, and many of us today are going, when? <laughs> I needed you yesterday. God's timing is not our timing, but he's coming back. God said, I will send my son into the darkness of this world to be the newborn king, and he's going to grow up, and he's going to be a man hanging on that cross, and I'm going to send him because the world is broken and sin came. And I can't stand to think about my children not being with me in eternity. So he sent his son to be the savior that you and I needed. The good news of great joy is that Jesus Christ was born the Savior of the world came to do these things, preach good news to the poor, proclaim freedom for the prisoners, to recover sight for the blind, to release the oppressed. Jesus Christ was born, and he did all of those things and more because he shed his blood on that cross for you and for me. On the night when the angel came to those shepherds who were watching over their flock, they were not living in luxury they were living in a broken, hurting world. 
And I can just imagine that in the midst of their suffering, they were clinging to their faith, wondering, God, are you ever going to do it? When's he coming, God? And in that wondering, if God was ever going to keep his promise, this angel came. Can you imagine what that was like? Angel came and he said, today's the day, and you are the people that get to hear it first. Because there's a baby being born in Bethlehem. Verse 12 says, The angel announced to the shepherds that they would find a sign of God's faithfulness. There was a promise. This will be a sign. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. He's lying in a manger. And with that announcement, all of creation could not stand to be silent. Along with the angel, a whole multitude, multitude of heavenly hosts began praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. When you and I hear the good news, when we receive it, we too respond with arms up and singing praises of glory to God in the highest because our Savior was born. There's always a response when the announcement is made. The shepherds responded by going to Bethlehem. They went and they saw Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger, just as the angel had said. How do you and I respond? Do we run to Jesus? Do we receive the great news of joy? Or do we run away from him? There's going to be a response. We will either receive him and it will be good news of great joy, just like the angels received him in the heavenly hosts and the shepherds. Or we will be like King Herod, and we will respond as this news is joyless and disturbing to our spirit. One way or another, we will respond. Do you receive it as great and joyous news? Or a joyless annoyance. If your response has been and is today still that we receive this news as great joy, then God invites us to participate in his redemptive work. When we embrace the good news that Jesus Christ was born, then we are invited to not just have the Christmas joy in our heart, but we are invited to go and to share the good news. It's what the shepherds did. They heard it. They received it. They responded. They went and they saw, and then they spoke to everyone who would listen. That, that would have been a stir in Bethlehem in this, this side of the mountain, don't you think? Hey, did you know an angel came? And he told me to go look at this baby, and I did, and this is a Savior, and you should go see. It would be wondrous and amazing and marvelous when we start talking about Jesus coming into our life. Is that how people respond to us? You are crazy. There is no way that that it could be true. But Jesus came, and Jesus changed the life of those shepherds, and he changed the life of everyone who received the great joy. And he changed my life when he came. And he changed your life when you received the news about the baby and you responded to it and it became part of who you are. And there's no way we can just keep it to ourselves. We've got to go out into the world and deliver the same message that the angel delivered more than 2,000 years ago. You and I need to go and proclaim that the long-awaited Messiah was born when we receive it and we respond it, we go and we tell. So go tell your neighbors and go tell your friends and go tell your colleagues and go tell the people in the hallways of your school. Go tell complete strangers. Just go tell someone about the baby who changes us. We're going to hear a song and then we're going to pray.